Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. We can come to order, please. This is um, the December 16, 2019, 7 p.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Gailey. Um, Commissioner Sutton is not with us tonight, but we do have Commissioner Boswell, Commissioner Lashley, and Vice Chair um, Steve Carter. So welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you care to, uh, you may join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just lift up our hearts to you tonight with uh, praise and thanksgiving for a beautiful day and for this holiday season, Lord. We um, just especially want to pray, Lord, for all of those people in our community who have lost loved ones recently or in the past who may really be struggling with this holiday, who have a hole in their hearts that they're missing somebody really close and important to them. And we just pray that they would feel your peace and your presence with them and that you would touch them in their lives and give them comfort, Lord. We also pray for all those in our community who work to serve and to help other people, that you would recognize that their work, that you would bless them, and that you would um, help them to feel the appreciation of the community for all that they do. We pray for those who are serving our country overseas the holiday season, that um, you would keep them safe and that they would uh, feel your presence and your peace as well. Please bless this board as we go about our work tonight. Uh, we pray that everything we think, say, and do would be pleasing in your sight and that you would make us worthy of the callings which you have set before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 If you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, our first order of business tonight is we have a special person to recognize and a special award to present. So if uh, Officer Triplett could come forward and the sheriff. All right, let's uh, get over here. And um, I have the, this uh, Officer Triplett is receiving a very special award tonight. It's the Life Saving Award. Um, and I'm going to read what he did so y'all can, um, can recognize his, uh, his bravery and his thing quick thinking. So on Wednesday, September 4th, 2019, at 8.05 p.m., Detention Officer Joseph A. Triplett was conducting his security rounds in iBlock. As Officer Triplett approached cell number five, he observed what appeared to be some type of rope around an inmate's neck while the inmate had climbed on the sink. Officer Triplett asked the inmate what he was doing. The inmate responded, leave me alone, and fell off the sink, tightening the noose which was around his neck. Officer Triplett used his radio to call for assistance, then rushed to the aid of the inmate. Officers Robert Jennings, Joshua Wise, and Madison Walker responded to assist. Because of the actions of Officer Joseph A. Triplett in utilizing his training and his alertness while making his rounds, I recommend Officer Triplett for life-saving recognition. This was a job well done, and that's signed respectfully, Lieutenant Brian Andrews. So we have this to present to you. There's your life saving pen to get one. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did, Sheriff, did you want to say anything? Do you have anything to add? I know he does. I want, I want, <laughs> I want to thank him because that's probably been a lawsuit following hanging in the jail. And, uh, you know, I've got enough of them. <laughs> But we have, we have a lot of fine officers and a lot of people do not understand 
uh, the hard work they put in in that detention center. And I'm telling you, you always have to be on your toes. And you were that evening, and thank you so That's much. That's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Next on our agenda is uh, time for public speakers uh, on topics which are related to agenda items. Um, so we have uh, rules for public speakers posted on our website as well as available to review when you're on your way in. Each person gets three minutes to speak. Um, we ask you to please remember that and uh, that we have quite a few people who are signed up to speak, so we need to be conscious of our time. There's 30 minutes total allowed for public comments, and so if um, you know people talk on, or if uh, you know it takes a while to switch around and stuff, I'm gonna, somebody might not get their chance to be heard. So, um, with that being said, if we could have Isaac Panzarella. Good evening, uh, Chair uh, Gailey and uh, fellow commissioners. Uh, my name is Isaac Panzarella. I reside in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak to you today. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of North Carolina. I've been practicing here in the state since 2003. And I'm employed by the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center at NC State University, where I uh, support technical assistance on clean energy development. I'm not here today representing NC State. I'm here as a private citizen just to talk about um, the solar development and the new um, heavy industrial development ordinance. Um, now, first th uh, thing I wanted to talk about was existing solar farms in Alamance County. Under the old ordinance, there were 75 foot parcel line setbacks and uh, no requirement for a vegetative buffer around the perimeter. Um, you are seeing a rise in solar energy development, so it's important to, you know, to address that with um, regulations. Um, however, the new class, uh, high, high heavy industrial class uh, two or, uh, classification requires a 150 foot parcel line setback and uh, also a very uh, dense double row vegetative buffer on, buffer on the project. And that is really not in line with what we've been seeing uh, around the state and in the uh, surrounding counties. Um, you're doubling the setbacks and that really does put a, uh, impose a, a strict um, and, and limitation on solar development. Um, I'd, first I'd like to talk about some of the work that we've done in uh, for the Clean Energy Technology Center. In 2016, we worked with a number of stakeholders uh, to develop a template solar energy development ordinance for North Carolina. I have copies of that here for you all um, if you're interested. Um, this was developed uh, in, with stakeholders, like I said, and those stakeholders included uh, folks from DEQ, uh, from the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, and it was a consensus document. And some counties have uh, adopted this into their own ordinance, this template ordinance. Uh, in this, um, on page 8, table 2, there was some suggested setbacks from parcel lines. Um, in terms of this, the, the larger solar facilities, um, there was a recommendation of 50 feet setback from um, the front side and rear of residential uh, low density, so it's like single family, and then 25 feet setback from uh, light industrial, commercial, heavy industrial, and office. Um, so like I said, some uh, counties such as uh, 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 where Rocky Mountain is, that they've adopted that standard. Is that all set? That's your time, it's up. Okay. <laughs> if you would, do you, have, do you have copies of that model work? Yeah, oh, sure. with our county managers. Or okay. if you have one for all of us, you can yeah, pass, pass that. Yeah, I'll pass those out to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank you. Thank you, sir. Extra step for This is helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Uh, Walt Whitman. <coughs> Can I pass these out? Yes. <coughs> I just wanted to give you an update on some things that's happened since I was here two weeks ago at the meeting. Uh, the Sheriff's Department has been very responsive. Uh, they came out and did an investigation, brought the CSI out. Uh, they took pictures, measured bullet holes, uh, they met with the DA, and they felt like they were pretty positive that uh, Mr. Cole is the one that's shooting across my property. Uh, he said he was going to move his targets, and he hasn't. And he has the only thing he's done. Uh, if you the paper I gave you on page one, the first picture is he put some signs up that says "Danger, keep out, shooting range." Mm. So I don't know if he got some legal advice or he just decided to do that. But I'm not going to go on his property, so we know it's dangerous because he's shooting across my property. <laughs> the picture on the bottom, I used the app on my phone and I outlined the the orange shaded spot is pretty much the maximum he can use for his shooting range and it came out to be 3.3 acres and with some of the information I gave you about shooting ranges uh, at the last meeting Caswell County you have to have a minimum of 20 acres for a shooting range and by him putting these signs up I guess he's self-describing that he has a shooting range now uh, and on the back uh, page two the top picture he cut down three pine trees, probably about the size of your arm, and he took them over and laid them behind his targets on the bottom picture that's closest to my property line, which are four yards off the property line. So I don't think he's done a whole lot, uh, but I just wanted to give you this information to put with what I gave you at the last meeting, and I know you hadn't had a whole lot of time to do that. I did call another county. I called Randolph County Sheriff's Department and they have an ordinance that says the same as Orange County and Castle County, mm -hmm. that if you fire a projectile on your property, you're responsible to keep it on your property. And as you know, we don't have anything in Alamance County. Anybody in the county can shoot across somebody's front yard as long as they don't damage anything. There's nothing that can be done about it. And uh, if you'll look at those pictures and, and, and everybody in here think that if you backed up four yards off your property line and you put your child's swing set or your grandchild's swing set out there and somebody's shooting bullets across your property line, what are you going to do? You know, I don't think we should wait for someone to get shot before we do anything about it and come up with some different ordinances and even something now. Regulations for shooting ranges since that's what he's described, what he has. And uh, so I gave some of that information to you on the last meeting. and. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Right. Thank you very much. And I made a mistake. I was supposed to make Mr. Whitman wait until the end I, of the meeting. I was going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That was slick. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Henry Vines, you're not so lucky. <laughs> Henry signed up to speak, but he's on the Jordan Lake roll, so that's the non agenda. Um, Carson Hartcrater. Good evening. Good evening. I was here last month. My name is Carson Harkrader with Carolina Solar Energy in Durham. Is there a limit on the number of people or just the overall time? Each person gets three minutes okay. and the total time allowed for the whole part okay. of the agenda is 30 minutes. Okay, but everyone who signed up can speak. Mm, as long uh, as we don't run over 30 minutes. Okay. okay, great. I just wanted to make sure. Um, thank you all so much. Um, we are back here uh, talking about solar. Um, as Isaac mentioned, um, the, the previous rules that you will have were 75 foot setbacks and um, the current new class one is 150 feet, which we feel like we can live with, class one, 150 feet, and the new vegetative buffer. Um, it's the class two with the land use spacing that's the challenge for us. And my attorney has told me that I can't use a variance there's North Carolina law at the state level that on variances that she doesn't feel would be um, able for us to get our financing with using that method. So uh, asking to go back to class one as part of a potential amendment process, 
I also wanted to let you know that we did reach out to Stephanie Thurman, who's the woman who spoke at the prior hearing with lots of concerns. And um, we went to her house, left her a note. We've been in contact with her on phone um, and text message. And she sent you all an email today. Yeah, today. You received it. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I wanted to make sure you had all seen it because um, she had planned to come and was not able to come, but um, she was just voicing her support for solar. So, um, yeah, we have a project we're really hoping to do in Alamance County, bring in some new tax base and a low intense use and um, ask to hopefully be considered to be moved back to class one. Thank you. Thank you. So Chelsea Miller. Good evening. Thank you so much for allowing us to speak at this hearing. My name is Chelsea Miller. Mm -hmm. I live in Alamance County in Burlington, and I'm here to speak a little bit about our property as some of land that's proposed to be used for the solar um, solar field. And I just wanted to say how we, my husband and I, his family's lived here for over a hundred years, and we love Alamance County. We moved my parents back here. We feel really passionate about this place. We own a veterinary practice, and we just would really love to be able to use our land for this use. We have a, 140 acres, and we've spoken to all of our neighbors about this. They're very supportive, and obviously, we're a pretty tight community. So. I just wanted to come here and kind of voice that and hope that there can be an amendment process to kind of reconsider these things. So, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. William Flo. Yes, thank you. I was here earlier as well. Uh, William Flo, I'm an attorney in Randolph <laughs> County. I'm here representing Mary Frances Blanchard, who's a longtime resident. Um, she's still 101, and uh, we're we're hoping for 102. Um, she wants to create a legacy with her farm, so she doesn't <coughs> see a need for her to sell it or for her grandchildren to sell it. And uh, in her family, that's what she's down to at this moment, is uh, three grandchildren. Um, both of her children are passed away. Um, in Liberty, we've had a positive experience with two solar farms. Uh, because they're quiet, and there's not noise, there's not traffic, we don't have to create schools and infrastructure, uh, and, and I can pass along to you our experience has been positive. Um, I appreciate that you're taking a careful look at how you protect your community, and uh, there's a part of me that says solar doesn't really fit into something when you say heavy industrial. I think about manufacturing and uh, things like that that disturb the soil. Um, this is not the case here. And uh, Alamance County is in this I-85 corridor. You're going to continue to uh, have people come in because of your attractive location. Um, continued need for this power source. Uh, our neighbors in Chatham County uh, years ago created a facility which is nuclear. <laughs> so you have posted signs that say if you hear a siren, you know, uh, pay attention. Uh, that's a little bit of an eerie feeling as you go down 64. Uh, certainly, here's an alternative that uh, is much safer and cleaner. So. Uh, on behalf of Mrs. Blanchard, I thank you for your attention. And uh, I think we're down to the buffer requirements and how we make them mm -hmm. feasible for it to be economic. Um, so thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Kelly Hare. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Kelly Hare. I am a Alamance County resident as well as a member of the Sierra Club and I do work in the sustainability field and I am also here to talk about solar ordinances. 
Um, I'd like to ask that the solar be moved from the more restrictive class two to class one, which is already quite restrictive as you heard tonight. Um, solar energy is one of the fastest uh, growing energy sectors. It's both um, economically and environmentally sustainable. I believe that the reclassification to class one would greatly benefit Alamance County. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And David Andes. <clears throat> I'm David Andes. I live in uh, Northwest Alamance County, and um, I just wanted to point to a, sort of a larger picture of this that um, we heard not long ago from the UN panel on um, climate change that they were giving us about 10 to 11 years before um, to reduce greenhouse gas in the atmosphere before we reach a point of significantly worse environmental events and poverty for a lot of people. And that includes Alamance County, North Carolina, the United States, uh, we're part of the world. And, and yet, just last week in Madrid, Spain, there was this uh, conference on, the, on climate change, international conference, and what came out of it next to nothing? The nations of the world could not get it together to say, let's take the next step and let's fight climate change. So what does that do? That leaves us local, state, county, city, to do something. And I think solar is something that's easy to do. As all everyone has said here, it's, um, it's quiet, it's, it's peaceful, it's, it's passive, and yet it gives us a way to have clean and renewable energy, and um, I'm advocating for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, that concludes our People who spoke signed up to speak on agenda-related items. Do you have any commissioner responses? I do. Climate change is a hoax. There's no, there's no information that proves there's a climate is changing. Weather changes. Climates don't change. Uh, they have they preach that that Tommy right for years and years and make, make these young people believe that they've got 12 years to live. And that's the stupidest thing you can teach a kid. That's all I got to say. Okay, um, and I expect that we'll have, we're gonna have discussion later in the agenda about the questions and the issues that you all raised. So I appreciate your patience and we'll get to that point on the agenda. And Mr. Whitman, Cliff, can you shed some enlightenment on what I think you went out there? Well, we had a meeting Monday week ago where I was advised about the sheriff going out to the conference meeting with Mr. Cole, looking at the trees. <coughs> Mr. Cole agreed to redirect his fire. Uh, I met with the DA, assistant DA, who indicates there is uh, potential for prosecution. I've also provided the DA with the, the uh, Shooting Range Protection Act, which was passed by our legislature in 97, which makes it very difficult to regulate a shooting range, even one that's owned by an individual by putting up a target in its backyard. So I've looked at the other county ordinances around Alamance County. All of them, of course, have zoning, and uh, and they regulated using uh, the distance from a heavily developed area, which is the definition of that changes from county to county. Of course. Durham County, uh, more heavily developed, more residential. <coughs> Orange County, uh, believe it or not, the only heavy, heavily developed residential areas around Chapel Hill. Um, but their ordinance says you, if you have a piece of property, you have to be so many feet from the nearest residence. In this particular case, Mr. Whitman doesn't have a residence on his property, but the nearest residence, I believe, is about 1,300 feet from where this uh, gentleman has set his table up and has his rifles. So if he went and put a tent up out there and spent the night, he's got a residence, right? Well. I don't know, you have to talk to the planning department about that. <laughs> but anyway, 
If, if this gentleman will just redirect this fire, I think. Well, he doesn't look for these pictures like he has any intention of. Well, he he is inviting prosecution. Uh, and Mr. Whitman is coming. Uh, he advised me tonight. He's coming to speak to us tomorrow, and he has a, uh, a potential recourse on the criminal side. Great. Anything else? Okay, if not, then we'll move on to approval of the agenda. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And then we have a few items on our <laughs> consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the next item of business is a public hearing regarding financing of our voting equipment project. Um, so do we have a presentation? you have anything to say before we open the pub public Susan, hearing? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, just a brief view on what we're asking to have approved tonight is back in November, we approached the board to have authorization to issue a request for proposal for $1,125,960 that would be as an installment loan to purchase new voting equipment. Um, we have had six bids to come back. We had our bid opening on December the 6th at 3 p.m. And of those six, staff would recommend having J.P. Morgan be awarded the bid. They came in at 1.9% financing. So over four years, our annual payment would be $294,000. $24.90. Great. So uh, we would be seeking a motion to open a public hearing. So moved. We have a motion and a second to open a public hearing regarding financing of the voting equipment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. So I'll start with this side of the room. To my left, your right. Is there anybody here who wants to be heard on the issue? of financing the voting equipment with the terms that Ms. Evans described. Seeing no one indicating that he or she wants to be heard, is there anybody on this side of the room, my right, your left, who wishes to be heard on the issue of financing the voting equipment? Mr. Vines, come on up. You have five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Gaines. Uh, my name is Senior Vines and I'm from Snow Camp. Commissioners, I would just uh, like to uh, be able to consider uh, paying for these voting machines rather than financing. One thing that we're financing is the J.P. Morgan. Uh, the interest is not going to stay here in North Carolina or around Mexico County. It's going outside the state first and foremost. Secondly, uh, I think that we could save this $50,000 that we're going to pay in the interest and use this toward some de developments and stuff that we need in the county rather than paying an interest. I was looking at the finance uh, report for this month and I seen that uh, over the course of the past four months we've already accumulated $900,000 in our fund balance. So if we have $900,000 that we've already accumulated in our fund balance, we could add a couple more hundred thousand to that and pay for these machines outright. We know that this has been coming upon us for you know some time. It's another one of those governmental uh, mandates, unfunded mandates that we face each several times a year. And uh, but I think it would be in our best interest to do that and pay for it than, rather than financing it. Um, I also know that you know, there might be some funds available outside uh, the fund balance that we could have maybe apply toward that to help pay for this. And I hope that y'all would consider doing this instead of uh, financing. We got enough debt as it is to work through now. And um, also, uh, got my train of thought here, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, um, by doing this, we could save save this fifty thousand dollars and also uh, keep the money here in Alamance County and let it work for our economy instead of someone else's. And uh, I appreciate your consideration on that. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Vines. Is there anybody in the overflow room tonight? All right. So is there anybody else who wishes to be heard on this topic? If not, we'd be seeking a motion to close the public hearing. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. So uh, do you does anybody have any responses to Mr. Vine? I got a question. Uh, <coughs> amount that you referred to, I'm assuming that's a timing issue with a increase in the fund balance. Would I be correct on that? Yes, so we've we've built capacity into our capital plan to borrow these funds. And in fact, I would encourage the board to proceed with the with the financing. Uh, you know, we're trying to safeguard our fund balance and to, to take a million dollars out of it to pay for these machines up front as we're about to start looking at uh, having our uh, credit reevaluated by Moody's and Standard and Poor. One of the big things they look at is our fund balance amount. We have the capacity to, to fund these payments in our capital plan now. It's, it's built into it. So um, I would suggest that knowing that we're looking at borrowing a tremendous amount of money next fiscal year uh, and we'll be going through a credit rating process where they'll be looking closely at our fund balance. I think what you're going to see at our audit is our fund balance is going to be close to 12 percent, which is lower than our target. That's already a problem for us. Um, I, I would be hesitant to recommend to the board anything other than financing it uh, the way we've got it laid out here. But it is an option. We do have the funds to do it. Um, I just think that it's good to be able to show the rating agencies that we have a capital plan. We're following it. It includes financing this equipment and we're, we're really guarding our fund balance uh, very closely. And that's a 2% one, right? No, 1.9. 1.9. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do we have the capability to, to uh, prepay this loan without any penalties? No, there would be a prepayment penalty that would be assessed. That's a swap on it, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Okay. What, what's the 2.06? The 2.06 is if we were to do it with a um, higher prepayment understanding with the uh, funding agency, what option two would allow us to do is a higher of a SWIT, of a swap, as Commissioner Carter was talking about. It would be prepaid without a penalty in whole, but not in part prior to maturity after the initial 12 months. So if we wanted to go with a prepayment a non prepayment penalty of that, then we would opt for 2.06%, um, meaning that after a year we could pay, pay it off. But we're already paying higher on interest. <coughs> and as Brian said, these payments are included in our capital financing plan and does not impact our tax rate. If you remember, we've separated capital from operations completely, so this is a uh, almost like a standalone budget. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Most of the time, Henry, I would agree with you, but this is the only reason I'm going to vote to support borrowing that money for four years. I'll make the motion. I second for that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the resolution to authorize borrowing funds for the purchase of voting equipment. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have a proclamation for National Radon Action Month. Um, is Philip Gibson here? Hey, come on up. Mr. Gibson is the North Carolina Radon Program Coordinator from the uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Well, first off, I want to say thank you very much for uh, proclaiming January 2020 as National Radon Action Month for Alamance County. As you know, probably from the email that I sent to the communication is that we're attempting to have all 100 counties proclaim National <coughs> Radon Action Month. Well, why are we doing that? Well, radon is the leading environmental cause of lung cancer in the United States, second only to cigarette smoking. So we do this every year. EPA already re uh, recommends, or not recommends, but regards January as National Radon Action Month. Um, you doing so is, it's our hope that residents of Alamance County will actually test their homes, which is a voluntary measure for radon. 
Now, we will be giving away 3,000 radon test kits during the month of January. Uh, that's statewide. Uh, we have worked with your county health department in the past. We continue to do so, as well as county extension offices for local distribution. We're not doing that in 2020. Uh, we've had a, a, a lower than desirable uh, return rate on the test kits, so we're hoping that those who do actually get a test kit will utilize it. Their retail value is $17 each. Uh, if folks wanted to purchase one, they could do so at their local hardware store. Um, so radon is a naturally occurring radioactive particle. It's the result of uranium that's naturally decaying in rock and soil. And we also are transporting rocks. So you all have your own quarry, I'm sure, in the county. And there are buildings that are built all over the country uh, with quarried rock, creating concrete. And so we also have high rises, condominiums, um, townhomes, and so forth that may have building materials that may have uranium. We, we, we know that that occurs in North Carolina quite often. Um, so with that, I do have a sheet, and uh, it's basically a fact sheet on radon. I'd like to give that to you if you don't mind. And I have enough for probably most everybody in the audience uh, as well. Thank you. Um, should I read the proclamation? Okay. So, do you have anything else? That's all. If you have any questions, uh, and certainly I'll stick around if anybody has any questions. Here's about a North Carolina one of the, uh, the high, high mm -hmm. of red on. We don't know that. Um, unfortunately, there's a very low number of homes that have actually tested for radon. You know, there's only eight states in the country that actually do uh, have regulations of some sort. Maybe they certify the professionals who do the testing or the mitigation. Uh, we have an emergence of issues that are going on in North Carolina that are unique. Uh, Wake County, for example, most folks have an assumption that only homes with basements or only homes in Western North Carolina are um, susceptible to radon. However, I'm working with three high-rise buildings and the owners of those condo buildings in uh, Raleigh right now because they have issues. But in the northeastern part of Wake County, um, we now know, and it, we only know it because homeowners have been testing their own well water. And because they're on the Rollsville, and I know that's my Kentucky accent that just uh, muddled that, but it's the R-O-L-E-S-ville uh, granite. So there's a, a huge number of private wells that are now um, seeing elevated radon and uranium. Uranium actually causes kidney toxicity. So there's some efforts going on there um, to try to help people with testing because it's also a pretty economically depressed area, the northeastern part of Wake County is. So um, we know that there are other issues that other counties are going to face once they start testing um, in a way that they haven't before, promoting this. Um, so we're trying to figure out also how to find the funds to help those folks who may not have the money in their personal bank account to actually pay for the $1,500 air mitigation system or the $5,000 water mitigation systems that are we're seeing right now. Um, so there's a number of states. Colorado is probably a pretty good uh, uh, spot for it. Nevada, uh, some other places that are similar terrain, if you will. Is Maryland one of them? Maryland certainly has a pretty um, high level. Pennsylvania, I work pretty closely with also the Virginia, uh, my counterpart there, because there are some granite rock formations that come out of uh, southeastern Virginia, Virginia into the northeastern part of North Carolina. Um, but again, uh, there are no rules, regulations, or laws about it. I know that in Wake County, what they're doing now is they're requiring uh, any new homes with a private well they're requiring that the home builder actually test the well water before they sell it uh, so they can actually communicate to the prospective buyer as to what the level is. Um, and in North Carolina, Real Estate Commission actually passed, well, not passed, but they actually made it mandatory for every licensed real estate broker in North Carolina to go through a one-hour training that started in 2017. So all 100,000 plus brokers throughout North Carolina have now been taken through that educational process uh, and made uh, four people curious per leader a material fact that has to be communicated. So, 
we actually had to deal with that in the house in Stanley County back in this was eighty four. Back then, it was because of the basement that we just kind of tested. But, uh, but it could be a it could even be a mobile home uh, with starting around it. Uh, all homes, all buildings are like vacuums, drawing in all kinds of gases. So radon is one of those. Or even a home with a crawl space where it's ventilated. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, ventilated, if they're ventilating it um, throughout the year, that might be a measure that they could use. However, most folks close up their vents um, so they don't freeze out their pipes. Um, so the, I certainly can communicate more uh, if you're interested. Um, but it's, the only way people will know is by testing. So I thank you all for the proclamation. Okay, well, I'm going to read it now. So this is the Alamance County Board of Commissioners proclamation in support of National Radon Action Month. Whereas radon is a colorless, odorless, radioactive gas that may threaten the health of our citizens and their families, whereas radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the United States and is the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers, whereas the National Academy of Sciences estimates that up to 21,000 lung cancer deaths <coughs> occur in the United States each year, Whereas radon is found in one in 15 homes across the United States have elevated radon levels. Whereas any home may have elevated levels of radon, even if neighboring homes do not, and living in a home with an average radon level of four picocuries, picocuries thank you, per liter of air poses a similar risk of developing lung cancer as smoking half a pack of cigarettes a day. And whereas testing for radon is simple and inexpensive and radon problems can be fixed, whereas Alamance County Public Health, United States Surgeon General, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services North Carolina Radon Program, and the North Carolina Advisory Committee on Cancer Coordination and Control support efforts to encourage homeowners to test their homes for radon, have elevated levels of radon reduced. Whereas many residents in Alamance County don't know about radon, yet need to know for the safety and health of their families and a proclamation of National Radon Action Month is an opportunity to educate individuals on the available measures to reduce radon. Now therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners do hereby pro proclaim January 2020 as National Radon Action Month in Alamance County, North Carolina. So adopted this 16th day of December 2019. So thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. And uh, I guess it's in, uh, do you want yeah. to take this? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Okay, so next on our agenda is a contract presentation from the Register of Deeds. All right. This is, this is very simple. What we want to do is to, the North Carolina legislature enacted legislation that required registers of deeds to redact uh, things like social security numbers, bank account numbers, and uh, other numbers that could lead to evil doings like uh, Identity theft. Like what? Identity theft. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I know a little bit about that. My social security number, my <laughs> an image of my signature, and my name has been published on the World Wide Web. And uh, so I tried to do something about it, and I contacted the Social Security Administration. They said, "Well, have you been have you been robbed yet?" I said, "Not yet." <laughs> But uh, they said, well, after, call us after you've been robbed. 
<laughs> well, I, I won't have time to make phone calls. That's right. <laughs> we all know that identity theft is a big problem in today's society. In that regard, North Carolina has the Identity Theft Protection Act to help protect its citizens. When it comes to identity theft, it's always better to be proactive. So in 2009, the act was clarified by the North Carolina legislature to make it clear that registrars can proactively redact social security numbers and other images of recorded documents that are readily available on the internet. As our office continues to field calls from concerned citizens regarding the safekeeping of their personal information, we want to go ahead and be proactive on our every citizen's behalf. Our current software provider, Logan Soft Logan Systems, has given us a bid for this project that we are ready to sign. Logan Systems is very experienced in these types of redactions. These both optical character recognition, OCR, which works well for, for type pages, and, and intelligent character recognition, which works as a supplement for handwritten pages, using OCR and ICR as well as their own sophisticated software rules. Pulled up a lot of potential numbers, which are then <coughs> used by humans to determine whether the found numbers need to be redacted. The combination of resources allows them to achieve an accuracy rate of nearly 100%, which in turn will allow us to better protect our citizens. And the thing of it is, they, if we use Logan to do this work, they, they, that's the outfit that, that we're using for recording our yeah, and uh, and after they do the redaction, the, the back redaction, they will then continue ongoing redaction. So it will assure us that we don't, well, mostly assure us that we don't slip up and let some Social security number get printed, printed uh, or published, yeah. disclosed on the internet. Uh, we're very careful about that. I, I personally, if you ask me for my, and I hate this term, social. <laughs> my typical response is, I'm sitting on my social. Do you mean my social security number? And. Uh, <coughs> Because if, if, if they say social, that, that means that they don't take it seriously. They don't understand the seriousness of asking me for my social security number. But anyway, I spent 12 years in North Carolina Senate. The most common request I had from constituents had to do with identity theft. And it, it's really a sad, sad thing. What mostly kin folks will do to kin folks, and uh, so we 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 we're, we're wanting, we're trying to get in front of this as much as possible, uh, and uh, so we want to. We have the money in the. What's the name of the fund? Automation. Automation fund. Automation technology. That's something that the uh, legislature said years ago to to uh, for register the deeds to have the money to for technology. When they realized that we that registers of deeds were not doing we're not keeping up with technology. And we are here <coughs> in Alamance County. Uh, we ran out of space when I 
about when I thought we would. And we are now all of our all of our land records are digitized. Now we have backups. We have paper backups. Uh, four of them. One here. <coughs> one in Greensboro. One in Raleigh. And one that I don't even know where it is. So then I can't slip up and tell you where it is. <laughs> and uh, all of our marriage and birth and death records are also digitized, but we have the paper records there in the office. Uh, and we're running out of space for that too, but we, we, we're making it. We're figuring out ways to rearrange things and, and uh, <coughs> What, what you going to add to it, sir? Um, that I have talked to Susan and uh, Randy and purchased and I think they have made some arrangements. But we do get calls just about every day. People worried about, you know, who can get to their information. And um, we'd like to go ahead and get this in place. Um, been working on it for several months now. Hey, does anybody have any questions <coughs> about the contract? No, looks like there's plenty of funds there to do it. So yeah. like we're, 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 I'll make a motion. motion. Okay, we have lots of motions and seconds. Um, if there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, sir. Okay, now uh, next on the agenda is uh, we're going to talk about how the if we do amend the heavy industrial development ordinance, what process we would have to go through at that time. Mr. Hagan and I were talking about that after the last meeting. Um, and Tanya Cattle, our planning director, has some information for us about what will need to transpire and take place before we can um, do that. Good evening, Gore. Nice evening. to see you again. Uh, you have a memo for me. We just printed out something pretty brief. Uh, this process, I think you all pretty much already felt it out, but this will give you very briefly the few steps that we kind of looked through the process to do. So for step one, it would be simple that the board here decides that there is a need for some type of amendment and they determine that amongst yourselves. And then for step two, the commissioners would make the request to the planning board to give a recommendation for a potential amendment to the ordinance. The purpose of the planning board is to come up with these types of things, language for the ordinance, some type of recommendation, and then it comes to you all. They, by state law, have about a 30-day time frame to give a response to you all. Can, you, of course, can allow longer if it's a big project, but there is a minimum there. Um, the planning board discusses the request sent over uh, their next at their next scheduled meeting and develops that recommendation to come back to you all. And that's if it's a very speedy, kind of small project, or they can develop a recommendation of this is what we need and this is what it should look like for us to get a full written recommendation of any amendment to you. Similar to what we did with the update of the HIDO, that took months. We ended up putting a couple more torums on to get that process through what it needed to to get to what planning board decided at subcommittee. Then it came back to planning board for their review of the subcommittee, and then for planning board it came back to you all. Depends on the project, depends on the depth of the project, depends on a lot of small things, but it can go in a couple different directions. But it does bounce back from planning board to commissioners. They do have that right to give the recommendation by law. From there, once it gets to you all, we do the same thing we did before. It comes to you all for a vote. If you don't have a unanimous vote on your first vote, you do have to have a second um, agenda item. First vote, you're going to have to have a public hearing. It's only required once. You don't have to do that both times if you need two votes. You only do it once by law. We do advertise that two weeks ahead of time, once a week for two weeks prior to. So it's something you have to give a little notice to so that the papers can print and do everything we need to do for that. That again is a state law thing. That's not local jurisdiction. Very brief. Did I leave anything out for you? If 
if we're only looking at making one change, such as moving the uh, oh, to the one. one. Yeah, the definition of the, the title is a little more broad than solar, but we move weird. that down one step, one class. Do you still have to come back with a presentation, or is that? I will do what you all want. We don't have to do a presentation. I can put it on the agenda, whatever the recommendation is from the board. You all can discuss. You can have me up here. That is your preference. So we can have it on the agenda for the first ship meeting in January, I suspect. Is that well, no. we have to go through a bunch. We have to, um, I think that tonight we can request the planning board give us a recommendation. We could do that vote tonight. And then the planning board has to get kicked back to the okay, planning board. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. right. Y'all have to do that. Right. And then I'll have to advertise the public hearing when y'all are ready to hear it. When is your schedule meeting in January? Mm, I think it's the 12th. It'll be the second meeting in January. <coughs> January 9th is planning board meeting, so it would have to be your all second meeting. Before. But they could, they have a right to more time than that if they so choose. Kind of depends on how they want to handle it. And we can limit our inquiry to the just the solar farm issue, right? Right. Exactly what you want them to look at. We write up this in them. Was there anything else under that category that we would not want to include in moving back from a class two to a class one? We I haven't heard from that. anybody. Yeah, excuse me. We haven't heard from anybody else. Right. We only heard from yeah, the solar. I think point. the renewable energy part is definitely something we need to look at. So we need to take a vote on that. Quiet. Just have a motion, second, and direct. I'll make the motion. We do that. Okay, we have a motion and a second that the board has determined the need for amendment of the heavy industrial development ordinance as it pertains to renewable energy sources, and to request that the planning board give a recommendation for potential amendment to that ordinance. Um, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. No. Aye. Anyone opposed? Great. And then the health department has an update about their accreditation. Good evening. Good evening. We have good news to share. Um, we'll be fairly quick about it. Um, so we're excited to share with you all that the health department has achieved reaccreditation, and not just reaccreditation, but reaccreditation with honors. Um, the accreditation site visit took place in, um, on August 29th. And we were one of the first counties um, to use the new electronic dashboard, which um, increased efficiencies for the actual site visit. Um, and we received the distinction of honors, which means of the 147 benchmarks, we met 147, so 100%. Um, and just a little bit of background, accreditation for local health departments became legislatively mandated um, in 2006. And North Carolina was the first state to mandate accreditation which then served as a national model for the public health accreditation process. Um, the accreditation as assures quality of local health departments based on assessment, assurance, and policy development. It also highlights our own best practices, our implementation of those, the collaboration that we have within our community, and innovation. Um, the accreditation process involves every facet of the health department, um, including every bit of our services, our fiscal arm, our administrative arm, our community partners, and our Board of Health. Um, and there is uh, one person that I would like you all to meet, if you haven't already, who coordinates us all and does this not just for the site visit, but for the whole year round, and that's uh, Ariana Lawrence, who is with me, who has the, the plaque to show you all um, and has done a superb job in preparing us for accreditation throughout the years um, and supports the staff and executes the delivery of the benchmarks and would like to say something. Um, so accreditation is the epitome of teamwork, collaboration, and quality improvement. Every employee and Board of Health member plays a role in accreditation, and we wouldn't have been so successful um, without the hard work that everybody has put into it and the leadership of Stacy. So. 
Yeah. She's a good leader, Angela. Yes. Good leader. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I didn't know about the last part. <laughs> <Added that. laughs> so thank you all for um, allowing us to share that moment of recognition, um, that it's a, quite an honor to be able to come to you all and say, we have really great news, and um, we appreciate your support um, of the health department. Congratulations. That's great. Thank, thank, you. That's great. thank you very much for all of your hard work and yep. your whole department, everybody. It's just so awesome. All right, the next uh, item on the agenda is the public speakers on non-agenda related items. And so, Henry Vines. Thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate this opportunity uh, to speak to you all night. I'm, I come to invite you, along with the public, I thought I'd take this opportunity to use the television to get this word out. Uh, North Carolina Farm Bureau and uh, North Carolina Division of Soil and Water Conservation are going to hold a meeting here in Alamance County on January the 15th, uh, 2020 at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, this will be a, a joint session uh, with with the Farm Bureau representatives along with the Soil and Water. Uh, this will uh, be a meeting that will discuss I'll say start, uh, let me just read this part right here. Uh, starting in January that will, uh, of next year, the Department of Environmental Quality will begin reviewing and writing the update Lake Jordan Nutrient <coughs> Medicine uh, Strategic Plan. The agricultural community in the uh, Lake Jordan watershed has been busy reporting rules and compliances since its inception. In many cases, these rules have significantly impacted our operations and our land management decisions. We will begin this evening by giving a, a brief presentation about the rules and the standards today and uh, around our uh, positions of, off with the decisions of the future presentation of the rules uh, re-adoption beginning in 2020. After our presentation, we will uh, open the floor and feel free to discuss anything about the Lake Jordan uh, rules and agricultural rules means to you and what you should uh, be doing to protect the water quality of the watershed and how now and into the future. <coughs> uh, your feedback will be shared with the Lake, uh, with Jordan Lake one Water Alliance, that's North Carolina Farm Bureau, is a participant, which is a group of, stock, of stakeholders, both inside and outside the state government, whose aim is to develop and comply with inter integrated watershed management plans, which will hopefully help residents with, with the watershed activity more environmental, socially, and economical benefits than simply nutrients uh, management, which we have been the ones that have carried the burden of all of this. Um, <coughs> so I would like to invite y'all also, uh, dinner will be uh, furnished by the uh, North Carolina Farm Bureau, and we would like for you, if you'd like to come, sign up, and you can sign up at fs 3 site F-O-R-M-S-I-T, dot com and uh, we would like to see it all there and uh, we'd like to buy, invite all large and small farmers to come to this and and get their input on this. What's the location? It's at the Agricultural uh, Extension Office in the auditorium. Here in town? Yeah, over here at our okay. Extension Office. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. <coughs> Did you get all that so you can send us an email about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Barrett Brown. <clears throat> Madam Chair, County Commissioners, um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. And uh, my name is Barrett Brown. I'm president of the Alamance branch of the NAACP. And, um, I can assure you, though I hear the um, sheriff has very fine accommodations, I plan to stay within my time. <laughs> uh, I want to say that I have had the honor of working with the sheriff a year or so ago. 
um, to pursue a peaceful resolution to, um, to racial tension in front of the Confederate monument in Graham. And he has always had an open door for negotiation. Even when we disagree, we have had a cordial and respectful relationship. There are two things that he said to me in private that I don't think he would mind me saying in public. One is that his, his priority is the public safety and that he is the sheriff for all the residents of Alamance County, not just some. That said, we have some concerns about the ICE program, as you know, and we uh, call on the county commissioners to use all of the oversight and general and budgetary to help us make sure that in his laser-like focus on keeping the public safety, that there are no unintended consequences to the 287G program. As Ronald Reagan said, we trust but verify. Um, one of those concerns is that um, folks are not being transferred who are seeking political asylum. Um, one is that uh, considerations will be made for children who are abruptly separated from their parents due to um, being transferred to the ICE program. Um, that immigrants are not afraid to call the police because they're afraid that they're going to be, find themselves in a cycle where they may be uh, uh, transferred. And I bring this at the time, at the holiday season, because I would like to remind you that the baby Jesus himself was an immigrant and that we would, in the spirit of uh, it's Matthew 25, like to remind you also that, he's, that Jesus said, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Brown. Good to see you. All right, that is the end of the people who signed up to speak tonight. Do we have any commissioner responses? Okay. Um, Mr. Bonds, I'd like to just say that you mentioned the Jordan Lake Lawn Water Association, and I represent Alamance County on that. And so I'm very familiar with that body's work, and it's very interesting taking an integrated approach to water, where it's not just looking at, um, you know, chemicals out, chemicals in, is looking at the management of the watershed as a total system and expanding our idea and understanding about how water is impacted. So it's really interesting and I definitely will try to find fs3.formsite.com so that I can RSVP to that on January 15th. I'll call you. I'll put you in. You just write it down. You can send that website out to all of us. I still have Thank you. Tori, did you get all that? She's working. It'll be in a minute. Maybe if the Farm Bureau could just be sure that we get it. Our business is just one of those return like you return invitations it's a website you just punch on there and it comes up and ask how many is coming and with you and pretty good all i had to do was click on it was on the all right we'll check it out all right anything else anybody else have anything else to well, say um but we have the commissioner comments there at the end okay. so we have a couple of things to do just just try to stay on our agenda um County Manager, do you have a report? I do not. All right. Well, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to go over his 15-page thing. Hope the board has a Merry Christmas. No, no report from me. So thank okay. You. Do, I, do we have any commissioner comments tonight? Following uh, the recent activity in downtown Graham, the protests that occurred, and I will make a point of saying that your organization, to my knowledge, was not involved. Mr. Brown, that's good planning or organizing of that event. Um, some accusations were made uh, to the effect that uh, the ICE detention program, implying perhaps that the sheriff's office might be holding something similar to a concentration camp. Well, I was pretty sure I knew that wasn't the case, but I don't like to make pronouncements about something without having experienced it myself, so I may have took it upon myself to visit with uh, Lieutenant Kennedy over to the ICE detention area and uh, get a complete tour, visited with some of the detainees in two of the different cell blocks. Um, I have to admit my cap capability at Spanish and communication was not what I'd like it to have been, but other than that, um, what I saw were clean facilities, air-conditioned uh, detainees that get uh, clean laundry every day, have uh, multiple pairs of underwear and uh, t-shirts, socks, 
uh, sandals and whatnot, and uniforms uh, provided to them when they're brought in. Um, I was really shocked at how much they offer. They have a law library they have access to in multiple languages. There are indoctrinated in what they're expected to do and what's expected of the detention officers when they're brought in they're sat down in front of a video screen that provides a video in the language that they understand whether it's some english spanish or some other foreign language um, they have access to a um, i don't know how many of y'all are familiar with skype most of you probably but if you're not it's a two-way television program you can use basically on your laptop or ipad or whatever <coughs> So they can communicate with people not only in the U.S. but in outside of the U.S. on the system. Uh, they also have uh, contact access with uh, ICE, and if they can, if they submit a request, ICE, ICE is required to reply to them within 72 hours. I mean, the the operation over there is so specific and so focused on taking care of those individuals. But I would encourage, and I don't know if the sheriff, sheriff may whack me upside the head when I say this, but I would encourage anybody who uh, is, is concerned, at the very least if you're concerned about it, take the time to look. And I'd encourage the other commissioners, if you have the time, to uh, schedule a visit and just see. I was, I was impressed at what we're doing to try and make that stay. As, as I, I, there's no way you can say you're being detained in jail and it's fun. But, I mean, it was... It was, we were doing everything, the county was doing everything we could. The sheriff was doing everything he can to make them as comfortable as they possibly would be under the circumstances. I just I applaud him for that. Thank you, Sheriff. Thanks, sir. We've had uh, inspectors come from Washington, D.C., not associated with ICE, went through that jail, interviewed inmates, staff, and looked at everything, and we got a glowing report card from them. Same thing that happened with ICE before the uh, Older DOJ got all, all upside, upside down. <laughs> yes, sir. But uh, we do not have the 287G no, program. No, that's right. Uh, and we're just holding ICE to Dane Thank you. Anybody else? I'd just like to say briefly I think that there was a letter to the editor or something in one of the newspapers regarding the Sheriff's Department and how they handled that protest um, couple, through three weeks ago and saying that um, you know, the Sheriff's Department had been unreasonable in how they had handled the situation. And Commissioner Carter and I had the opportunity to be present um, in the Sheriff's Department during that, um, during that episode, and I had, we had the opportunity to personally observe what was going on. And to say that those people were deprived of their rights is garbage. They did not have a permit to protest and the sheriff's department sheriff johnson and his discretion allowed a protest to take place in the street there was an illegal protest um those people certainly would have been within the law to have each and every one of them arrested and the sheriff decided to use his discretion not to arrest them but to allow them to have extra first amendment rights and that they did not have a permit and that it was an illegal demonstration. And I think that um, instead of following up those activities with inflammatory rhetoric, propaganda, attacking the sheriff, they could at least acknowledge that they didn't have a permit and give credit where credit is due. That's right. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to do that right now. So thank you. And it was also a really good I found personally to be there to observe because I was able to personally see some some places the sheriff's department needs some help and some equipment and some some ex some things that they could could use in the future. So it was very useful to me um, to be there from that perspective, particularly. So, is there anything else anybody wants to say? All right. Well, everybody have a Merry Christmas, and we will see you next year. Oh, and we might cancel our meeting for the 1st of January. Mr. Higgin and I were talking about that. If it turns out we have a really light agenda, then we might let that one slide. <laughs> by, so just watch out for that. So That's thank our you. Merry Christmas <laughs>
Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.